On the 30th of January, 1649, a 48-year-old man put his head on the block and waited for the axe blow that would change the course of British history. We cannot imagine what a bold decision it would be to kill your king. You're killing God. The story of the downfall of King Charles I is a battle between two men who both believed that God was on their side. One was the king, who stood for a centuries-old tradition of royal rule. The other, an ordinary soldier named Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell is a huge, looming presence behind it all. He doesn't want to see the king dead, but he does believe that he should be brought to justice. Hold! The fall of Charles I is one of the most nail-biting, breathtaking dramas of our history. But how did such an extraordinary event come to happen? Was the defendant guilty? Undoubtedly. And could Charles himself have done anything to change it? He could so easily have saved his life. It's what people wanted him to do. There is a tipping point at which I think the only thing they can do is cut off the head of the monster. On the 17th of August, 1648, six years of brutal civil war were about to come to a bloody climax. These were brutal wars. Hundreds of thousands of people died. More people, in one sense, died in the English civil wars than were casualties in the First World War. It split the nation. On Preston Moor, Two mighty armies met to decide the fate of the nation and its king. But the king himself was far away from the battle that would determine his future. Charles I was on the Isle of Wight under house arrest at the hands of his own parliament. He lived a fairly pleasant life. He had a mistress, uh, he played bowls, he had a court. He was still a king. He wasn't an English idea of what a king should be like. English kings are supposed to be physically full of presence and strong looking and powerful looking. And here was this tiny little intellectual man who liked reading romances. I think Charles was in a kind of limbo. He's in the odd position of the Civil War going on almost without him. On one side of the war were the Royalists who supported Charles's position as supreme ruler. On the other were members of Parliament who believed that their king was too powerful. They were known as the Parliamentarians. At the core of the war, is this fight over what kind of governance there ought to be. And the view on the one hand, the royalist view, that the king is accountable to no one and that his will can be law. And on the other hand, the republican view, which is that the king ought to be subject to the will of the people. But Charles was absolutely convinced that he had been appointed by God to rule the people of England. He really, really believes it. From birth, he believes it completely, um, that, which really makes him a fanatic. There's this fairly stubborn integrity, I think. He knows who he is, he's appointed by God, and he's going to do the right thing as far as he's concerned. But the man commanding Parliament's army also believed that God was on his side. That man was a soldier named Oliver Cromwell. There's a sort of rough quality to him. This rather uncouth, shouty man with blood on his collar from his shaving cuts. I mean, he's a gentleman farmer, and he goes from being a gentleman farmer to perhaps the greatest general we have ever had. He has this very strong sense of having been chosen himself by God. 
to revenge the appalling atrocity that he sees that Charles has brought on the people. And this was a man who believed in providence, in divine providence, that God manifested his intentions through the result of battles. Cromwell strongly believes and has encouraged his entire army to believe that they are fighting a war inspired directly by God, a war that we might associate more with the Islamic world now. Cromwell's army was the most feared and revered of the parliamentary forces. It was known as the New Model Army. Cromwell was a very good soldier. Not somebody who was just a good tactician, but somebody on the battlefield who could lead people into victory. So you can imagine wanting to die for Cromwell. I I'm not sure I'd want to die for Charles I. The battle raged for three days, but it ended a very one-sided affair. It was the battle that won the war for the parliamentarians. With this victory, Cromwell's army now had the opportunity to bring Charles to justice. The New Model Army were about as enthusiastic about Charles as you would expect, say, the British Army in 1945 to be about Hitler. But to Cromwell's horror, some in Parliament were willing to negotiate a deal that would allow Charles to keep his throne. Cromwell, in a sense, created a monster. His new model army is so efficient and so ruthless and so good at their jobs, but they're also not going to go quietly. They want proper reparation for all the terrible things that have happened to them and to their country and to their families, and the man who represents it is the king. Little did Charles know that Cromwell's army was about to overthrow its parliamentary masters and put Charles on trial for his life. Cromwell's army had won the decisive battle of the English Civil War. But now it was locked in a deadly conflict with Parliament and the King over whether Charles should keep his throne. There is absolute distrust from the New Model Army to Parliament and from Parliament to the King. For now, Cromwell had no choice but to let Parliament play its hand, which it did in a series of negotiations on the Isle of Wight. Charles faced down the leaders of Parliament in a head-to-head -head battle of wills. They were willing to restore Charles to the throne if he was willing to give up some of his powers. But Charles was not the kind of man to give in easily. The stubbornness of Charles I is something you, you come across in every, every account of him, every person's meeting with him. It must have been so frustrating to have to deal with a man like that. And yet, you have to admire the fact that his convictions were so strong. He believed that God was on his side. That was what his father had taught him. That was how he'd lived his life. He's a very slippery man. Charles, I think, had that quality in the sense of being able to m completely convince people that he meant what he was saying. And then as soon as the door was closed, he just said, no, I'm not doing that. The negotiations dragged on for weeks. Meanwhile, Cromwell and his army were growing so frustrated that they decided to do something extraordinary. I think it's clear that by the autumn of 1648, Cromwell has decided that Charles is a man who cannot be trusted. And so I think he is committed to bring him to justice. It happened in the back rooms of a London pub, where the temperature of Cromwell's army had reached boiling point. The army leaders, led by Cromwell's son-in-law, Henry Ireton, drew up a document known as the Remonstrance. 
This was a remarkable moment for the army and a dangerous one for Charles. The remonstrance was basically a demand for justice. It was the first time that there had been a sense of this man is guilty of a crime. What it says quite categorically is that the king has proved himself to be treacherous and traitorous, has taken up arms against his own people, and for that deserves to be brought to justice. The remonstrance was the army's manifesto, a most radical statement of the army's intention, not just to trim the royal powers, but to put the king himself on trial. Even more shocking, it was in direct conflict with the leaders of parliament they supposedly served. Once that remonstrance is printed, little pamphlets were distributed, bought, read in coffee houses, debated in churches. So the army is appealing as a political force as much as a military one. But as a prisoner on the Isle of Wight, Charles seemed unconcerned by the impending threat of Cromwell and his army. On the 30th of November, a group of men arrived with horses and a boat and offered Charles the opportunity to escape. He didn't take it. Historians still debate why, even today. One thing that we can be sure of is that he was a man possessed of a great sense of his own importance, and so he was not interested in scurrying away in the middle of the night. And of course, you know, that comes from a position of extraordinary arrogance on his part, the idea that it would seem very kind of low down and below his dignity to escape. He was profoundly anxious that something would go wrong if he tried to escape, and it's clear from some of his conversations later on that he is worried that he's going to be assassinated that he'll be you know, killed in a hole somewhere. Perhaps he still thought at that stage that, that the negotiations with, with Parliament would bear fruit and that he didn't even need to, to try and get away. Charles had good reason to be confident. By early December, he was on the verge of reaching a deal with Parliament that would allow him to keep his throne. But Cromwell's army had other ideas. On the 6th of December, 1648, violence met democracy in an astonishing clash that has been called the only coup d'etat in British history. A senior officer in the army named Colonel Pride, along with a group of soldiers, stormed the House of Commons. Pride's purge in early December is the army saying, enough. You know, I'm sick of these conversations between Charles and Parliament. We don't trust any of you. We're going to purge Parliament. They march in and exclude to purge those members of the Parliament whom they believe to be unsound. They stand at the door of Parliament with a list that's been drawn up and say, you're in, you're out. The fact that it's in historical dress <laughs> makes it sort of slightly romantic in our eyes. All you have to do is imagine 500 men in, in combat fatigues occupying Parliament and only allowing those MPs in who will vote the way that their Commander-in-Chief decides. That's, that's absolutely appalling. They don't hurt anybody. Hundreds of thousands of people have died. We need settlement. Going into the House of Commons and booting out a few sort of corrupt MPs seems to me a very easy way of creating a settlement with very little harm. That very night, Cromwell rode into London from the north. It is interesting and telling, I think, that he returns just after everything has happened. It, it, it fits with what we understand about his character, his vacillation until the last moment, his willingness to let other people take the lead when he's not entirely sure uh, of where God's purpose uh, should lead him. Cromwell was such an all-pervasive figure. One has a sense that he must have gone along with it, he must have agreed with it, maybe even suggested it. I think Cromwell's fingerprints are all over 
Pride's purge. He remains cleverly just out of the picture, but it couldn't have happened without his say-so, and if he hadn't agreed, he would have reversed it. He didn't. Parliament was now the puppet of Cromwell's army. Charles's deal with the parliamentary leaders was dead, and his fate was in the army's hands. On December the 19th, 1648, Cromwell had Charles moved from Hurst Castle to London and a step nearer to justice. On his way, members of the public lined the streets and shouted words of support. Charles knows that his people love him. Most people by the end of 1648 are sick and tired of fighting and they just want a return to normalcy. He did have reason to believe, quite rightly, that there was a growing groundswell in some parts of England for a resurgence of royalism. Very few people, in, even in, as late as 1648, would have got out of bed in the morning and said to themselves, I know what this country needs is a republic, let's get rid of a lot of them. The pressure was on Cromwell and his army to deliver the justice they'd promised. But even now, no one could have predicted the eventual outcome. You know, probably if you did a vox pop on the streets of Westminster and said, well, what do you think is going to happen? I think there would have been very, very few people who said he's going to die. At Windsor, Charles behaved like a man without a worry in the world, confident, perhaps, that God would protect him. He celebrated Christmas Day with an extravagant banquet. He wore fine clothes, ordered specially for the occasion, and his servants served him on bended knee. He's in an extremely precarious position, and there he is, feasting away on Christmas Day in the most kind of lavish and kingly and apparently unconcerned fashion. And I think that this can probably put down to this fundamental failure to understand the seriousness of what is happening to him. I think rather than being a silly man, he was actually a man who was so absorbed in the story that he was telling himself that he didn't notice anything that was going on around him. Maybe Charles just loved Christmas. I think it has all the classic symptoms of total denial. He has to have been much happier. You know, it's his own space. The king's back and everything looks good. This is somebody who believes he can win. And, you know, maybe that was stupid, but I think you have to admire it in the end. At the end of December, in the most dangerous game of his life, Cromwell brought the situation to a climax. He and the other army leaders voted that Charles's trial should go ahead. Immediately, the House of Commons began preparing a court to try the king. I think the mood was enormously nervous. Everyone did not know whether this would work or not. It had never been done before. Where are you going to do it? How are you going to do it? Who's going to do it? All of these things suddenly come as a massive shock. The idea of legally putting a king on trial, that is the most extraordinary aberrant thing. It's the kind of thing that I think is equivalent to, I don't know, you know, to taking the sun out of the sky or something. It's that crazy. It's that extraordinary. There is no framework for it whatsoever. The lawyers were up tearing themselves apart. I mean, on a very basic level, how can you find someone guilty of treason when they're the monarch? Cromwell's lawyers quickly found a way round that. They said, of course, a king can be tried for tyranny, which is the sort of crime that kings can commit. 
But had Cromwell already made up his mind that the king should die? Cromwell is not profoundly opposed to Charles the Man. He thinks he's bad, he thinks he needs reforming, but he doesn't set out to kill him. He would still have preferred a settlement, but he came to see that it was going to be impossible to settle with Charles because Charles wasn't willing to make any of the concessions that would have make a, made a settlement work. To view Cromwell as a, a murderous tyrant, I think, is, is absolutely wrong. He doesn't want to see the king dead, but he does believe that he should be brought to justice. Cromwell and Charles were about to meet face to face in a trial so dangerous that only one of them would come out alive. Charles I was about to stand trial for his life, charged with treason. This moment was completely unprecedented in British history. No sitting monarch had ever been brought to trial before. There's a sort of escalation of, of ideas. Things which had been impossible to think of became thinkable. The charge against him is a very watertight charge. It says, if you levy war against your people in your parliament, you are guilty of treason. And he has done that. There might have been a good chance for Charles if he just played to the script. The script was well known in the period. If you wanted to be treated with leniency, you basically said, sob, sob, it's a fair cop, gov, and I'm ever so sorry. He still holds what he thinks is an unbeatable trump card, which is the constitution of his kingdoms requires a monarch. He is the monarch. They can't do away with that. Charles was to be tried by 68 judges and a lawyer for the prosecution. There was to be no one for the defense, except for Charles himself. Westminster Hall was packed with thousands of people. And you know, for Charles, who is used to having, if you like, a, a gap between him and those normal people, those crowds, it must have been very traumatic. He must have been a very impressive figure to all those people who were suddenly realizing they had their king on trial for his life. He was heavily bearded at the time, and he refused to have a parliamentarian barber near him with a razor. He's got rather tatty wooden chair to sit on, not a throne. You know, he's possibly had a bit of abuse from the soldiers blowing smoke in his face. He, he had no close supporters. He was a man very much alone with his dignity and with his kingship. Watching Charles's every move was Cromwell. For him too, the stakes could not have been higher. Their legal foundation was so shaky that at any moment it could tip. And you think the men who are guarding the king might just say, no, he's the king, and go and stab Cromwell. Putting Charles on public trial is an immensely risky course of action for everybody who commits to it. And everybody understands that that is a really radical thing to be doing. And interpretable as straightforward high treason. They are on desperately shaky ground and they're hanging on to it by their fingernails. Leading proceedings was John Bradshaw, the president of the court. The prosecutor, John Cook, would make the case against the king. My Lord President, held. My Lord President, according to an order, hold! The king picked up his cane with the silver tip and banged him on the shoulder, said, hold! My Lord President, according to an order of this High Court, to me, directed for this purpose.
Charles is used to having people do everything for him. The silver sort of cap of his cane rolls off and he clearly you know, looks around, who's going to pick this up for me? And nothing happened. And he just gestures to him, do pick that up, Mr Cook. And no one picks it up. When the king has to stoop and pick it up himself. If Cook had automatically picked it up, that would have been the end of the trial, the king in command again, but he didn't. And the king in front of his subjects had to bend down at the barrister's feet and pick up the silver tip. And that symbolized the bending of the king to the law. He is not in that place and at that time anymore a ruler of men. Uh, he is the prisoner of the court. Finally, John Cook read out the charge against Charles. See, I do, in the name and on behalf of the people of England, exhibit and bring into this court a charge of high treason and other high crimes, whereof I do accuse Charles Stuart, King of England here present. How do you plead? At first there was silence. Then Charles played what he thought was his trump card. I would know by what power I am called hither. And when I know what lawful authority, I shall answer. His attitude is one of as much contempt as he can muster. When the charge is read out, accusing him of treason and treachery and murder, he rolls his eyes. He thinks this is ridiculous. He is the king. You cannot put on trial a king. And in any case, he murdered no one. He did not levy war against anyone except to defend himself. He was really incredulous of what was going on about him. He honestly didn't recognize the legitimacy of this court, and therefore he was not going to engage with it. Refusing to subordinate yourself to the court that's about to try you for your life is not the wisest course of action. It's a brilliant strategy for him to deny the authority of the court, brilliant at the level of denying his adversaries his acknowledgement that what they're doing is in any sense right. It's what my grandmother would have called silly cunning. It looks like a smart move, but actually the consequences are really disastrous. The king had thrown the court into uproar. As long as he refused to enter a plea, they were unable to proceed. The first day of the trial for Charles I ended abruptly. But was Charles's fate already sealed? And had it been sealed from the moment he walked inside the courtroom? It's absolutely a show trial. It's the implementation of what the army has been calling for publicly for months. The point of the trial is to air the army's case against Charles, that he has committed treason against his own people, they want to bring the king to justice and do away with him. So many historians are so ignorant, both of the, the law and of the religious obsessions of the Puritans. A show trial is a trial that is rigged from the outset. This trial wasn't. Charles had many opportunities to save himself. He didn't take them. On the second day of the trial, Cromwell and the other judges were hopeful that Charles would come to his senses and make a plea. But he refused once again, and the judges were growing desperate. They still leave the door open. You know, if you repent, they say this three times, if you repent, we can work with you. And Charles continues, you know, he's a one-trick pony by the... But I don't recognize the authority of this court. 
I say, sir, by your favour, the Commons of England was never a court of judicature. I would know how they came to be so. He doesn't really give straight answers. He doesn't defend himself. He just says, you have no right to, to try me. I do not recognise the authority of this court. And it becomes rather frustrating. How do you plead? I will answer the same so soon as I know by what authority you do this. In ordinary criminal trials at that time, you didn't enter a plea. They pressed you. Big rocks were put on your chest until you either agreed to plead guilty or not guilty, or your chest caved in and you died. So uh, rather than subject the king to that, of course, uh, he was tolerated. He behaves as a king should do in circumstances like this. He is faced with a completely unprecedented, illegal attempt to try him as the head of state. So he treats them with disdain. It was a strategy that only goes so far because it refuses to enter a defence, and people start to think after a while, maybe that's because you've got no defence. So far, Charles had played out his plan perfectly. He had refused to accept the authority of the court. But now he made his critical mistake. Charles said, I'm no ordinary prisoner, but in one way, he did behave like a lot of ordinary prisoners at their trial who make the mistake of talking to their guards. And the king did. He told the guards that he didn't regret any of the deaths that the wars had caused. That was, of course, conveyed back by the guards to the prosecutors. From the soldier's perspective, this is absolutely you know, dynamite and just shows this is a man of blood. He does not care about his people. It made them realize that despite the crimes that could be proved against him, he had no regrets. And I think that was, that really was the turning point of the trial. The lack of remorse Charles revealed to his guards betrayed his true feelings to the court. It was a fatal error. The next day, the atmosphere in the courtroom had changed considerably. It's not until the court has had a couple of days to judge the king and his implacable determination to refuse to make any compromise that uh, Cromwell comes to feel that, that really God uh, wants this king dead. I think there comes a point where Charles's doggedness and arrogance would have exhausted a saint, and Cromwell wasn't a saint. The following day, Cromwell and his fellow judges made their move. Their plan was to proceed without Charles's plea and build a case against the king. Over two days, the court called a series of witnesses who provided evidence that Charles had committed war crimes. They'd collected all this evidence of the king ordering his troops to torture uh, people, ordering civilians' homes to be burnt, which was the crime of pillage. Well, what could be more uh, clear than that? That Charles had willfully prolonged the Civil War and uh, been responsible for considerable loss of life and very nearly the utter ruin of his kingdom, I think is undeniable. Charles wasn't invited to hear the witnesses. He was forced to stay in his rooms. Still at the core of his belief, I'm king. They're not going to kill the king. By the end of day six, 
the witness testimony was over and the court decided its verdict. Charles had made no plea. The outcome was a foregone conclusion. He was guilty. What would Cromwell do now? King Charles I had been put on trial by his own people, charged with tyranny. The court had found him guilty. All that was left was to hand the king his sentence. But even now, Charles's fate was still in his own hands. By the final day, Charles has refused to acknowledge the court. He's insulted it. He won't come to grips with the charges against him. But of course they give him, <laughs> bending over backwards to be fair, they give him a final chance. Even at that last minute, if he'd stood up and said, I'm sorry, I personally believe they would have compromised. Rather than sort of doing anything gracious, uh, he tries to buy more time. I desire to be heard and I hope I shall give no occasion of interruption. You may answer in your time. Hear the court first. If it please you, sir, I desire to be heard. I desire before sentence to be heard before the Lords and Commons. And he says, look, let me do a political deal. Let me go and talk to the Lords and Commons. I've got a deal that I'll offer, which is fantastic and will save the kingdom. Uh, they don't buy it. Even at the end, he still asks, oh, well, might I be heard? Might I be heard in Parliament by the Commons and the Lords? Um, and of course he can't be heard, but in his mind, he still ha has this idea um, that this has all been an aberration. I don't think there was any way back for Charles now, at this point, because Cromwell had made up his mind. Cromwell is never committed to killing the king. Um, until the very last moments, when really the king has given that court absolutely no alternative. On the afternoon of the 27th of January, 1649, the court confirmed the sentence on Charles I. He, the said Charles Stuart, as a tyrant, traitor, murderer, and public enemy to the good of this nation shall be put to death by the severing of his head from his body. And at that moment, psychologically, clearly, he is dealt a tremendous blow. He cracks. Will you hear me a word, sir? Sir, you are not to be heard. Sir. No, sir. No, sir. Clark, draw your prisoner. It's possible that until that point, he really, at some level, did not quite believe that his time was really up. I may speak after sentence, sir. I may speak after the sentence is over. The sentence, sir. I say, sir, I do. There's something desperate about it, something gabbly and awful. It's awful feeling that it's, it's over, the game's up. I may speak after sentence by your... Charles, at this point, actually panics, I think, and is uh, now realizes that he's maybe misplayed his hand. He wouldn't plead, but he wanted, when the trial was over and the sentence announced, he wanted to have the last word, and that he was denied, and I think that cut him to the quick. Yet Charles's fate was still not certain. Before sentence could be carried out, the death warrant had to be signed. But some of the judges were terrified by the idea of signing such a revolutionary document. They didn't even get all the people who tried him to sign the death warrant. Because 
right at the end, people were going, but we're not really going to do this, are we? So some, some of them had gone that far and then absolutely couldn't go the, the final step. We cannot imagine what a bold decision it would be to kill your king. You're killing God. Even if you're a radical Republican, this is a huge step to make. In the end, 59 of the 68 judges signed the death warrant. It was enough. The 30th of January, 1649 was a bitterly cold day. We know he asked for two shirts because he was worried that it was so cold that he would shiver and he was concerned that people would think he was shivering with fear. As far as we know, Cromwell was not present at the execution. Charles was led through the banqueting hall, which was you know, built by his father with an extraordinary painting which still exists of his father rising to heaven. They directed a scaffold outside and he stepped through a window to a huge crowd, all of whom must have been very used to the idea of public execution but nothing like this. <laughs> In his final speech about going to an incorruptible crown is kind of perfect. I go from a corruptible to an incorruptible crown, where no disturbance can be, no disturbance in the world. Even though he doesn't speak out loudly, uh, that's irrelevant. He knows that his words are for posterity and that those who hear them will communicate them. And they do very well as the last words of a martyr. His comportment on that scaffold was incredibly impressive. Is probably the most significant thing he achieved in terms of his legacy. And then there was this terrible cry from the crowd. Um, an exhalation, I suppose, of that breath they'd been holding. There is a physical sensation of, what have we done? When the act was done, I'm sure Cromwell felt that there would be a better future for England and the English people. And perhaps he was right, but not the way he'd planned it. Just 11 years later, he was dead. The Republic was over, and Charles' first-born son was sitting on the throne. In 33 AD, Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. Blame has been put on the Romans, the Jewish priests, Judas, even the victim himself. But who really killed Jesus? 
And the last days of Jesus Christ is in two weeks here on Channel 5. Where tomorrow night at 8, New Secrets of Great British Castles continues with historian Dan Jones exploring Carnarfon. Next tonight, can Alex save an establishment that hasn't even opened from financial ruin in the new Hotel Inspector?